This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Before we get to the actual episode portion of Reasonably Sound, I want to issue some corrections and retractions. Uh, my friend Gabe, who is the writer and host of a YouTube show called Space Time, which is about space and time and is great. You should watch it. YouTube.com forward slash PBS Space Time. Let me know that I got a couple things wrong in last episode about uh, the sounds of the universe. He let me know that Robert Dickey's last name is not pronounced Dick, that W map is not pronounced W M A P, and that the Don chorus is not actually audible to human ears. Like, if you were out in space, you would not be able to hear the Don Chorus with your ears. It is only through its sonification by radio equipment that we are able to experience it. So while it is not a sonification in the sense that it is a set of data that is turned into sound purposefully so that we can understand something different about it, it is still no less a sonified phenomena. So that was a, it's a very important distinction to make, and I want to thank Gabe for reaching out and letting me know those things. Okay, now, on to the episode. How much is one song worth? If we're going to take this both literally and economically, which we are, there's an endless number of approaches. For a musician in their bedroom or studio making music, is a song worth the gear used to create it? The time taken off their day job to go into the studio. The cost of the studio rental to record it? the subway fare to and from, the lunches eaten during the mastering sessions, the duplication of the CD, the marketing budget, and everything which led up to that point to make it all happen? What if our singer-songwriter has a degree in music composition or performance? Do we divide the cost of their education equally across all of the songs that they've written as they are released into the world? This approach has a lot of variables. And in practice, in the world, we know our idea of the cost of one song, the amount we pay for it, it doesn't vary too much. And it certainly doesn't vary conspicuously based on the background of the person or people who have made it. Unless we're talking about that new multi-million dollar single copy Wu-Tang record, which, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about that later. It's safe to say, I think, that for any recording artist, the worth of their songs, assuming that's what they're making, songs, or song-like and length things, or collections of song-like and length things meant to be recorded and distributed on some form of popular media, be it radio or record or CD and so on, the worth of these things has to be determined, or at minimum, influenced by the media entertainment industrial complex surrounding them. Audience, publishers, distribution houses, studio talent, labels, management designers, merchandising, manufacturing, and an endless parade of people and things ready, willing, and able to determine the worth and cost of their own involvement, and so determine the worth and cost of a song. And even if a particular act does not deal with such a sizable squad, that there are people out there who do sets a kind of baseline. It's also probably, or 
definitely worth noting that because this is a party of people coming together to figure out the price the market will bear for a piece of music, that doesn't mean it's a decision reached by committee. I don't mean to suggest that this consortium of forces is one where power is distributed equally or where the network of interests, resources, and influence is evenly distributed like so many Taylor Swift CDs across the Walmarts of America. It's not. It is, at least as far as major market popular music and the people hoping to make their way into that market are concerned, highly hegemonic. There's a hierarchy of decision makers, and a fair number of them work independently, or in some cases in spite of the person who has made the music having its value determined. Which is to say, the worth of music, like much art, isn't determined by its practical actual cost. That practical cost has a bearing on particular recordings and their starting retail prices, but that's just one specific situation, one that we're going to talk about at length soon. I hope you like numbers. And regardless, that situation is no different from other specific situations in that the music's worth is, past a certain point, determined for it. That's what we're going to talk about today. Some of the things that determine the base level of what music, popular music specifically, is worth. The range of this worth is great. On the low end, a song is worth an average of about six thousandths of a penny. That's 0.006 of a cent per individual stream on a platform like Spotify. As far as retail is concerned, we'd probably agree that somewhere between a buck and three bucks per track on most popular media, physical and electronic, is fair. And on the high end, a single song is worth God only knows how much for choice prime placement on the radio or in a TV show or a car advertisement, let's say. Like, when DJ Shadow's work ends up in a Chevy commercial, you had better believe he's not getting a six thousandths of a cent every time this thing plays. When you obsess over perfection, elevate form, Evolve function. And reinvent a category. You attract a lot of attention. Context is just as important as anything in determining how much those people who determine the worth of a song determine the worth of that song to be. There are contexts which are inherently more costly. In my limited experience, advertisements chief amongst them. For obvious reasons, too, I think. When your work is being used to make money for other people, it stands to reason that you should also be making tons of money. There's also the complicated question of condoning the products being hawked. Does DJ Shadow own a Chevy? Does he like Chevys? Reason dictates that he must, to a certain degree, if he lets them use his music. That is, I guess, if it was his decision to make. This all reminds me of Tom Waits' stance on such matters, which is definitely a digression, so we'll start the music. If you've heard Tom Waits in an advertisement, you haven't. That's not Tom Waits. That's a sound-alike, which is a thing that exists. He's sued a couple of them over the years. And I mean, of course, Tom Waits' sound-alikes exist. One, Tom Waits is popular and amazing and inspirational, and so, of course, some enterprising individuals are going to bite his style. And two, because Tom Waits doesn't approve the use of his music in advertisements. Ever. Long pause. Except once. As far as I can tell, the only advertisement Mr. Waits ever lent his work to was for the not-for-profit organization Feeding America's Spot, produced in collaboration with the Ad Council. The Spot, which I struggle to call an advertisement, is about the number of people who go hungry every day in America. It's one in eight. Other than that, Waits has never allowed anyone to sell their product using his songs. Why? His stance is a pretty principled one. In an interview a few years back, Waits said, and no, I'm not going to embarrass both of us by trying to do an impression, he said, 
Songs carry emotional information, and some transport us back to a poignant time, place, or event in our lives. It's no wonder a corporation would want to hitch a ride on the spell these songs cast and encourage you to buy soft drinks, underwear, or automobiles while you're in the trance. Artists who take money for ads poison and pervert their songs. It reduces them to the level of a jingle, a word that describes the sound of change in your pocket, which is what your songs become. Remember, when you sell your songs for commercials, you're selling your audience as well. In another interview, this time with NPR, Waits said of himself, I'm not a jingle writer. Meaning, I guess, Waits recognizes the non-monetary worth of his music and doesn't want to risk diminishing it in trade for more monetary worth. His music is worth more than ad money. It's worth the things it comes to signify for his audience. I will say, he's maybe onto something. I bought DJ Shadow's End Traducing the day it came out in 1996, weirdly about a month before Tool's Anima came out. These two records would remain favorites for quite a while, up through the start of college, at least. Anyway, to Waits' point about personally important music being reduced to a jingle, having its worth diminished by its being placed in a context alongside crass consumerism, I can't help but recognize shades of that sentiment now, listening to Building Steam with a Grain of Salt, the first track from Introducing used in that Chevy commercial. A track for which I hope Shadow was paid handsomely. Or, I don't know, maybe I don't? I'm not sure which is better, for him to have profited greatly, or for some personally significant piece of music to be, roughly speaking, ad-scoring bargain bin material. Is it better for his track to be worth more to him monetarily, or to me, non-monetarily? I don't know. Also, I mean, let's be honest here, that's a false dichotomy if there ever was one. And in a certain way, isn't profitability enabled by the effectiveness of his music? Is it my fault that Building Steam is in that Chevy ad? I don't know if I can deal with this. All right, buckle up. We're going to talk lots, right now, about numbers. A garden variety compact disc costs about a buck to manufacture. It's tough to get an exact number nailed down. There are many ways of arriving at this figure, and they're all dependent upon which companies are providing what materials to what other companies, and if there's retail placement and shipping, or if it's done DIY, and of course economies of scale factor heavily into all of this. Pressing a quarter of a million CDs is cheaper per CD than pressing a hundred. But if you're standing in the middle of a Sam Goody or Coconuts or Strawberries or Tower Records or Virgin Megastore looking at a C of 10 to $16 Ds, they probably all cost about a buck to manufacture. That includes packaging. A black vinyl record, 12 inches, normal weight, costs about six bucks to manufacture. If you get plain labels, just black type on a white label, and you don't get jackets, so it's just a record in a paper sleeve, which is a thing I don't think anyone would ever do, you can get the per unit cost down to about three bucks. And that's only if you put those records in their sleeves yourself or you make your brother do it. He'll do it, just promise him he can go on tour with you next time. An MP3 is complicated. 
Creating an MP3 from the masters, the same or same-ish tracks sent to the duplication plant to create CDs or records, is a thing that has no specific cost associated with it. At least, it hasn't the numerous times I've seen it happen for the MP3 releases of records that I've worked on. Most computers, piloted by a knowledgeable audiosmith, are capable of producing an MP3 of near perfection for most discerning listeners. Whatever cost there is for MP3 releases is usually incurred upon each sale, a percentage taken by iTunes or Bandcamp or Amazon or whoever's serving up the data. Interestingly, I have known people who run labels to not offer free downloads of MP3s with the purchase of CDs or vinyl because of the cost associated with hosting MP3s on a system which determines that the right people are getting access to the right MP3s, and also the cost of printing and including literature in the CD or record explaining how one retrieves their download. It costs money to put records in the sleeves, so of course it's going to cost money to put a download card in there too. Unless, again, brother, hey, you were the one who told him he couldn't play bass, give him a break, let him do something. Anyway, this is all to say that manufacturing costs of an mp3 are nothing. But there are some platform-specific distribution costs, seeing as how distribution and manufacture of MP3s are, in most cases, exactly the same thing. This makes sense. So, but yeah, here we are, looking at our $16 CD or $20 record or $10 MP3 release, and wondering, wow, where does all that go if they cost a buck, six bucks, and nothing to make, respectively? For CDs in the 90s, according to the New York Times, quote, 35% of the retail price goes to the store, 27% to the record company, 16% to the artist, 13% to the manufacturer, and 9% to the distributor. In that same article, a record executive talking on the condition of anonymity described the method for setting the prices of retail CDs as, quote, very arbitrary. Rolling Stone provided the following breakdown in 2004 for a $16 retail CD. $0.17 cents for musicians' unions, $0.80 cents for packaging and manufacturing, $0.82 cents for publishing royalties, $0.80 cents for retail profit, $0.90 cents for distribution, $1.60 for artists' royalties, $1.70 for label profit, $2.40 for marketing and promotion, $2.91 for label overhead, and $3.89 for retail overhead. And actually, these figures come at the end of a long report about how Walmart wanted to sell all of its CDs at less than $10 a pop and were aggressive in pushing for that price. It's an interesting bit of history. A link to it in the show notes on infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound. More modern estimates about CDs from 2011 and 2012 claim that if an artist is signed to a major label, they'll make as much as $2 or as little as 50 cents on the sale of a $10 CD. That range is determined basically by how good of a contract they negotiated. A complete cost breakdown for vinyl releases proved tough to locate after a couple days of research, but I'd guess the breakdown is similar for big deal retail pop records. The artists get some, the labels and retailers get lots. If someone out there knows exactly what this breakdown is, inquiring minds definitely want to know. For MP3 downloads via iTunes, an artist attached to a major label gets between $0.08 cents and $0.20 cents for a single song download priced between a buck and a buck thirty. They might make between $0.80 cents and a dollar for each full album downloaded for $9.99. Just like with CDs, Apple keeps a full third of the cost of each download. The remainder is split between the artist and their label, based again on their contract. Independent artists, who ain't got to share with no one, get around 70 cents for each $1 download, $7 for each $10 album. Roughly all of this is true for Amazon downloads, too. One notable departure from this we keep a third and scram scheme is Bandcamp, who, in what we might at this point confidently declare is some kind of statement about their priorities, keeps 15% of digital and 10% of merch sales. 
But okay, this is all interesting, hopefully, and maybe makes you a more knowledgeable consumer, but there is a very big, very poorly compensated elephant in the room. Let's talk about streaming. And also, finally, the Wu-Tang Clan. Within the last year, there have been countless blog posts stating that no, streaming services like Spotify, Rhapsody, and Pandora are not going to save the music industry. This, really, should surprise no one. Spotify at all are able to succeed, meaning keep their lights on and employees paid, at a moment when the reach of global media organizations is great enough that they can effectively create hit music instead of waiting for it to happen. In my view, Spotify only works because there is music which is already popular. Spotify does not nurture music, it gloms onto it. It's about discovery, not income. Case in point, cellist Zoe Keating. An independent musician with significant internet notoriety, a self-described middle-class working musician who makes her living from the music she sells on the internet and the shows she plays to houses packed with people who have packed the house because they heard about and probably bought her music on the internet. Every year, Zoe makes public the details of her income from the sales of her music. In 2013, she made $75,341.90 from selling 32,806 singles and 8,635 albums on iTunes, Bandcamp, and Amazon. That's almost $75,500 for what we might estimate is in the neighborhood of about 118,000 MP3s. For two plus million streams across seven streaming services, including YouTube and Spotify and Rhapsody, she made dramatic pause $6,380.82. On Spotify, specifically, 403,035 plays brought in $1,764.18. To save you the math, that's four thousandths of a cent per stream. That's not a business model. It's a crisis. Well, in the grand scheme of things, it's disappointing and we can do better. But in the minor scheme of talking about how much music is and is not valued... I think it's a crisis, and not like running around waving your hands and screaming a crisis, sort of more like how postmodernism doesn't really mean after modernism so much as it means the crisis of modernism. $1,000 for 400,000 streams should herald in the post-streaming era, the crisis of streaming. It's a crisis I think we're all sort of implicated in. Well, implicated if you listen to music, and since you've been listening to me yammer on about it in fine detail for ages, I'd wager you do. The crisis is the result of a tension, I think, between people who make music wanting, or needing, to profit from it, and our sense of its worth based more and more, I think, on our ability to access it. Which is to say, as music has become more accessible, it has always gotten cheaper. Duh. Manufacturing has lots to do with that. Obvs. But at what point in history of manufacture, of distribution, does our sense of the worth of music shift from being based on some compromise between material, social value, and ease of access to being based entirely on access? Could it? Has it? Enter the Wu-Tang Clan. Whose next record, The Wu, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, will have but a single copy pressed. One copy. Toured around the world for private, tightly secured listening events before being sold to a collector at auction. They expect it will sell for $8 million at least. The Wu, once upon a time in Shaolin, is the opposite 
of a Spotify stream. The mode of its very existence is an assertion of worth and value over access. A stream is an assertion of access over worth, of ephemerality and convenience over pomp and bravado. One of these things you must arrange to go to it. The other arranges to come to you. Once Upon a Time in Shaolin will be cased in a hand-carved silver and nickel box made by Turkish artist Yaya, whose works, as it says on the Wu-Tang's website, quote, have been commissioned by royal families and business leaders around the world. So, you know, much like Jurassic Park, no expense was spared. I can't help but see this as some genius declaration, a complaint about the currently perceived worth of music, the value of the people who make it, and the technology which allows us to experience it. Once Upon a Time in Shaolin stands in over-performative opposition to the ephemerality of streams and even the pseudo-ephemerality of easily replaceable mass-produced physical media. Something so disposable, it might as well be temporary. Once Upon a Time occupies a singular place of extreme worth, available only to a group of people capable of justifying their access to a singular place of extreme worth. It's ridiculous. I love it. It even sort of asks some questions about ownership, like... Do you really own any of the records or CDs in your apartment? Or MP3s on your computer? We don't think of owning streams, though we do pay for them. But really, what's the difference? It's always there. You can mostly get it when you want, so... Is it yours? Not really. But when you own Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, you own it. Period. In this way... The Wu-Tang Clan says their hope is to equate the worth of music with the worth of great works of visual art. Works by Monet or Degas. Singular and important. I think they maybe set their sights a little low, to be honest. If they really want a challenge, it might not be found in getting people to experience the Wu once upon a time in Shaolin as a singular visual art-like experience. I think that we tend to have that when we experience live music all the time. The challenge, I think, would be to encourage a new and, in some senses, very, very old way of appreciating the worth of the rest of our music libraries. Our close-at-hand CDs and MP3s, streams, and on-demand playlists, and ability to discover a dozen new favorite musicians before lunch. The challenge would be in showing how our ability to access these things maybe makes them more valuable than some monolithic, singular thing, not less. Yet, here we are, behaving mostly as though the opposite is true. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at Mike Rignetta. Recently, I was on my friend Davis and David's podcast, The Electric Cybercast 2 Online, talking to them about our shared experience playing the text adventure game Zork, which I forced them to do, and as it turns out, is maybe not a nice thing to do to your friends. If you want to check that out, you can search for Electric Cybercast 2 online on iTunes, or you can check out the show notes for this episode at infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound.